okay, let's roll. This is going to be like herding cats probably. And it's so funny thinking that I'm supposed to be the one who keeps like order in this conversation or I am someone who's <laughs> been known for disorder in conversations. But here we go. Welcome to the Future's Edge podcast. I'm Jim Urio. As usual, Bob Iacchino, the Brains Mind Operation and the Coast. And today we have three of the great minds in, in economics. And you guys have heard me say this before. I'm not just trying to blow smoke. Um, all three of them have worked for the government, which is odd because all of them, I think if you press them, would think that the government is a bureaucratic mess that cannot be fixed. But we will go into these things. We have Joe Lavornia, who's a chief economist, uh, former chief economist from the National Economic Council under Trump. Brian Westbury, Chief Economist for First Trust. Bob Stein, Deputy Chief Economist for First Trust. Thank you guys so much for coming. We really appreciate it. So the, the, the first questions are going to be, um, we're going to talk about ethics and economics, which I think is a really, really interesting topic. But for you guys who are listening, don't think for a second that we're going to have th three economists of this caliber on here, and we're not going to do a relatively deep dive into the current condition. And we will do that too, but let's go on this first little bit. So uh, Joe, I'm going to start with you. We, Brian and I were talking before you logged on when Brian was trying to get his technology working um, about the different forces that push people in different ways. I knew Austin Goolsby you know, long before he went to work for um, the Obama administration. I knew what his opinions were on many things. And all of a sudden, he's working for the Obama administration, and it seems like he's a different guy. There's Paul Krugman's. There's Joseph Stiglitz's, where you look at what they're saying and just thinking everything we've learned in 45 year study of economics for, for me and for you guys is just is ridiculous. What are the forces? Is it just about money? I don't think, I mean, I, I think Jim, what you're saying is that the, the, the persona they took on in government was different than what they were in, in the private sector or the, or the previous public domain. Is that right? Yes. And the policy positions they took. So, yeah. Changed. I mean, right. So the, the I mean, you know, this is something interesting. And this kind of relates to Janet. I mean, I want to answer the question. This sort of relates a little bit to Janet Yellen, who seems to have been really made a bunch of different gaffes. And I think that reflects two things. One, that when she was at the Federal Reserve, she prepared in incredible detail for those press briefings, spent a lot of time going through everything. So she's, I think, been un unable to prepare for a lot of the ad hoc impromptu questions that you get from the press. But also, I don't think that she really believes some of the stuff she's saying. I actually find her to be a very bright, thoughtful woman. And I think part of the problem when you go into government is you have to say things uh, that you don't necessarily believe. You've got to sell what the administration's policy is in many instances. I think that's the problem. For me, when I worked for Trump, it was easy because Trump really is sort of a, he's kind of like in foreign exchange, you've got like, you know, free floating exchange rates. He's sort of like a dirty flow where the government would be involved. And it's sort of his policies are very, uh, very populist, which for me was an easy sell. It may have been a little harder for others that may have been of a certain ilk, free markets and all that kind of thing. But for me, it was an easy transition. So I think it really depends on the person. Certainly in, under Reagan, when my old boss, Larry, was there, and you know, he was a supply sider from the beginning and the get-go. So that was an easy sell for him. So I think it kind of depends on the person. I don't think everybody who's there is sort of selling their soul. And certainly I was there, as you, as you may have intimated, to try to do what I, I could to help in any marginal way that was possible. Ryan, so yep. you, we mentioned that's the political part of it too. But when you read Paul Krugman, Paul Krugman's won a Nobel Prize in economics. Like yeah. what, what is that? How does ideology get so in, intense in somebody's head that they can no longer look at a square and call it a square? How does this work? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there are things in economics that are, like gravity, right? I mean, uh, you know, I, to me, it's like we learn supply and demand. Uh, we we uh, we know about free trade. There are things that that we learn in economics. It doesn't really matter what your political position is, but you 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 have to support them. You have to believe them. Uh, and and yet, once it gets translated into a a, a political position, uh, they'll throw all that out the window. Um, and, and in fact, they end up making things up. And, you know, this whole Keynesian idea um, of, of, 
of, of, of a multiplier for government spending. So if, if government spends a dollar, somehow it's better than if the private sector spends a dollar. We know that's not true, and yet they'll say it all day long. Um, and that's why I always uh, say that, you know, Keynes, and now you have Keynes on steroids with modern monetary theory, uh, politicians love Keynes because he says government spending is good. Uh, they love modern monetary theory because it says they can print and borrow and spend as much as they want. In fact, that's good for the economy. And then what you end up with is you, is you get uh, economists, uh, so-called economists, I would say, that will end up supporting that. And, and you know, I, I guess my, the line I've used over the years is if, 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 if someone thought they could get elected by proving that they could boil water at under uh, 212 degrees, uh, they, they, they would be able to go to Harvard or Yale and find some professor that would get on stage and say, this guy can do it or this gal can do it. Um, that's, people want power. And, and, if, and if making a ridiculous argument that doesn't make sense uh, gets you power, people will, will do it. And, and I think that's what we're seeing today. Okay, so Bob, he, he mentioned power, he mentioned monetary theory, and he alluded to the fact how seductive it is to economists. Like even, like let's, and I'm not suggesting for a second that Larry Kudlow was wooed by modern monetary theory, but I'm just picturing, you know, a hardline conservative economist. He's there, but also he's in politics now too. I mean, back when he was with Trump. Is someone, is even someone like him, who is as clean and efficient as the thinking of economics, lured by the siren song of something like modern monetary theory is just about money? I, I don't think it's modern, modern monetary theory, but everybody kind of um, kind of allies the truth sometimes a little bit. I'll give you an example. And sometimes it has to do with TV. It's not just government or being in government or wanting to be in government, like, like it affects some people, even before they go in. They want it so bad, they'll say the things that they think their future potential employer wants to hear, okay? But it, it, I'll give you an example with cash for clunkers. Um, uh, it, hmm. we, we had people who knew better at the time with cash for clunkers in 2009. And they supported it because it kind of sounded good. I mean, it, if, if, uh, if I were the president and came up with it, I want everybody surrounding me to support that policy. And I am sure my PR people and my media people would say it's a great idea. And sooner or later, the economists have to, but even the economists on TV, right or left, kind of have to say it's a great idea because they know their customers, their clients, their viewers are going to hate them if they say it's a bad idea. I mean, my in-laws went out and bought a car. They knew it was stupid, okay? but they didn't want to watch anybody on TV telling them that it was a bad or stupid idea because they got a cheap car. Yeah, so hold it, Bobby, before you get in. So, Bob, it's an asinine policy because all of a sudden it was inter artificially supporting a business that didn't necessarily need supporting at all, correct? Why not have bucks for bicycles or pennies for pencils or support some other business, right? I mean, the whole idea was you had this excess inventory of automobiles, but the, and you wanted to clear them out to help the automakers. But, but you could have done it directly. You could have just given, given them aid directly or, or, or financed them through the bankruptcy process, which is what Romney came up with, which was distorted by Obama later on. But it, it's even you know, it, the vast majority of sales where cash for clunker checks were written would have happened anyhow. It was only a tiny fraction, maybe 10 percent of the cars that were sold were extra cars related to, to the policy. And so everybody got the money. Yeah, the point that uh, Brian, you guys are spot on. I mean, the point that Brian was making about power and then the uh, sort of the proximity to power. It, it, that's what does strike you when you're on the White House grounds is that you really are at the uh, are at sort of the center of the universe, at least in terms of, mm -hmm. of the United States. That, that, that sort of that, that environment is very rich in that feeling. And I think there's a little bit of human nature where people don't want to give that up. You become you become pretty important. Everybody calls you at least until the election. Everybody calls you back real quickly. If there's anybody that doesn't call you back. It could be. Uh, Joe Schmo from, from the White House. And, and they say, and that's intoxicating, right? Yeah, I, well, I think so. I think what happens is, it, yeah, I don't like, look, I, I, I'm too old now where I don't get as emotional as I would have when I was in my 20s. I wouldn't say intoxicating, but I would say, yes, for many people uh, that maybe aren't as grounded as perhaps maybe I am, or just maybe because of maturity, because I'm old, 
uh, yes, it can be intoxicating, Jim, absolutely. And you don't want to give that up. It's sort of like you want to, you know, you don't want to give up your Rolodex of contacts. Everybody wants to be loved. It's a little bit like in Hollywood when you get the Oscars, you know, what's, what's more important than your peers thinking you're great. And it's a little bit like that when you're there, because if you're doing economics, you're kind of important, not that you necessarily are important, but your position is, or your, your stature, you know, people don't want to lose that. That's a really, that's a really good point. And, and I'm going to broaden this out just a little bit. And I know Bob uh, Stein wants to talk about this too. Uh, but, but, you know, you go into the, the press room uh, after a Federal Reserve uh, meeting and, and you look at the press that, uh, and the questions they ask, they all want to be the person that Jay Powell calls and says, we're going to go 50, we're going to go 25. Can you write a story about it? You know, let's, we need to prepare the market. And so because they want to be that person, they're not going to ask really hard questions. They're going to, they're going to ask what the Fed wants them to ask. And, and I think this happens everywhere. It happened for the the CDC during COVID, it happens at the Fed, at these pressers, it happens in the White House press room. Unless they want to tear somebody down, then, they, then they'll go the other way. But, but most of the time, at least for the Fed, they don't ask hard questions. They ask they don't, what they don't the want to lose access. To hear. You're right, Brian, right. they don't want to lose access. Yep. Yeah, uh, I'll give you an example of this that Brian and I have noticed over the past few weeks. We wrote a piece two, three weeks ago at this point, I think, uh, maybe I've lost track of time, about how the Fed is financing itself right now, given the fact that it's cash flow negative. Now, there's the, the cash flow part, and then there's the balance sheet part. The balance sheet part is easy. The Treasury gives them a deferred asset or, or a negative liability or whatever, and they don't have to, the Fed doesn't have to hand their profits over to Treasury like they have for the past 80 years every Wednesday. They, they just, they, they, they get to fill that hole in the balance sheet, make it up, and then eventually when they're, return to profitability for long enough, then they'll start paying the treasury again. But that raises the question of how they're meeting their obligations. They have salaries to pay. They have buildings that they're either renting or cleaning or, 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 or uh, truck drivers or things like that. How are they meeting their obligations on a day-to-day, week-to-week, week-to-week, month-to-month basis if they're operating a loss? And it's a very simple question. And we've, like, We've bent over backwards. We, we've called the Fed. Okay, we've talked to a bunch of academic economists who just say, "Okay, uh, they're they're printing money," which is kind of vague. I mean, I'm like, "Well, what are the details?" Because you you can use printing money for a lot of different mechanisms at the Fed. Um, then we reached out to reporters and said, "Hey, can you can you find out what they're doing?" Nick Chiburos kind of danced around it in one article, but didn't really get to it. He focused on the balance sheet, not the cash flow issue. Nobody that we know of has come out and just asked a Federal Reserve official, how are you paying salaries right now? You're losing money, your cash flow negative. You used to hand all your cash flow positive to the Treasury Department. So where's the money coming from? I mean, it could be something easy. They're, you know, some of the bonds mature and they're not, they're not uh, uh, taking the money and reducing the Treasury account. They're taking some of that cash. We'd like an explanation. Nobody knows. So, it, okay, so it, it, it's just kind of odd. I- I have an explanation. Before Bobby, I want to get Bobby to have the next question. But perhaps they're just taking the information and trading their futures account like they had been for the last 30 years and nobody knew about it until FinTwit exposed it. And for you guys who are listening, these assholes were putting on CME futures positions right before announcements and making shit tons of money because of it. Bobby, you're, you're ball. I just say one thing, Jim. I'm sorry. Sure. I just oh, want to tell you yeah. that the background check is so intense that it is impossible for somebody not to know what they shouldn't do. But more importantly, Jim, Bob, and everybody, you know that anything that even slightly looks inappropriate, there's no gray, especially right. post-financial crisis. Yep. It's unbelievable. It sure is. I'm sorry, Joe, you said there's no what? I didn't catch your last word. I'm saying there's no way that you don't know that there's, there's shades of gray. Like, yeah. is this leak? The, 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 how things are perceived, even if it's legal, you know, when you're there, you got to be very careful. I just, I just ended up working on the sell side with, you know, you just have to be careful. Even if something is legal, you can still get yourself in trouble if somebody thinks it doesn't look appropriate. 
And I just find it amazing these people in these senior positions don't know that what they were doing, while maybe technically legal, could possibly look bad. Yeah. So I, I want to ask you guys about, to be honest, I think you already answered the main theme question of this particular episode, that, that which is ethics and economics. You guys have answered why they've fallen so far in terms of what they are. So I want to take this in a slightly different direction where, you know, it, a lot of people talk about economics being a science and they forget it's more of a social science, right? Than an actual technical science. So, and we had uh, Kumal Shri Kumar. I don't know if you guys know who he is. To me, he's one of the best interest rate guys in the world. We had him on a couple of weeks ago. And Joe, to your point, he called uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen Monday Janet, Tuesday Janet, Wednesday Janet, because she says a different thing on Monday and then a different thing on Tuesday and different thing on Wednesday. And from that perspective, you know, as you mentioned, and let's go Joe, Bob, Brian on this, in terms of Janet Yellen specifically, you said she's intelligent, she's thoughtful, but yet she championed something called the Inflation Reduction Act and said it with a straight face when it's basically a massive green energy spending bill with just a completely asinine name. So what parts of economics all three of your point of views, and then Jimmy, if you have one too, what part of economics is a science? Like what can somebody not say to a camera with a straight face because the entire world will go, well, that's complete bullshit. Yeah, look, good science, even social science is predictive. And, and Brian made the point at the outset, supply and demand are sort of immutable laws. I mean, it works almost in all cases. The problem, I think the issue again, is that people make sacrifices or let's say compromises. They make compromise, they make sacrifices to go to government, but it's a compromise. And if your boss or your boss's boss wants you to sell something, that's part of the deal. I just don't think, I, I think because Janet, you know, I do believe is, 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 has some intellectual rigor. I don't think she's very good at selling. I think it's obvious she's not very good at selling what she's supposed to be selling. I don't know if it's an ethical issue it's just, I just don't think it's necessary in her makeup. She's not a good actor. I think a lot of politicians are great actors. I think they right. know how to feign empathy. And, and that would be my response. But I think in the people, other people who are better at it, they say, look, this is the deal I'm going to make. The pluses outweigh the minuses because uh, this is my party. This, th these are generally my policies. If I have to compromise on a couple of things, I'll do that for the greater good. Bob? That's 100% right. I mean, when I went into the Treasury Department, part of the interview process is, are you willing to advocate for the administration even when we're doing something that you don't 100% agree with? And so you have to ask yourself, um, if I don't do this, somebody else is, but they might have slightly different priorities for me than I do. And so you kind of compromise yourself a little bit by going in. You try to keep your head down when those issues come up and not address them. Uh, but you do the best you can. You say things like, you know, um, it can be said that and then and take that position. <laughs> or some people take the position that or the administration's argument is <laughs> you, know, you, you don't say I believe. Um, yeah. And so you allied the truth a little. I'm sure Joe and Brian, Brian was kind of a true believer when he was there for a year and a half. <laughs> and so he didn't really have to compromise himself. But I'm sure Joe yeah. and I are familiar with the phrasing of things that you have to say at times. Well, Brian, before yeah. you answer this, if, if yeah. I could, before you answer this, it's probably sort of what we all have done on TV, right? When they ask a question, we don't want to answer. And we go, well, of course, everyone's looking at, but what, what they're really looking at is this. Right. And you talk about what you want to talk about anyway. So to Bob's point, um, is it basically, Brian, that these guys, that people like voters are single issue voters. Most people right. are, right? So if somebody is, is you know, uh, pro-life or somebody's pro-abortion and that's their issue, they take all the other garbage with the candidate as long as they're that one issue. Is that what right. this is? Yeah, I think that's part of it. You know, uh, Bob uh, made me remember a story. So uh, actually we both worked, Bob Stein and I both worked at the same time for Connie Mack, who was a senator from Florida, head of the uh, Joint Economic Committee, and, and we wrote a flat tax uh, bill. And, and so, you know, it, you can lower the rate as long as you tax more people, uh, the more you start to, to uh, uh, exclude things um, or allow deductions, the higher the rate has to go. So one of the things that uh, we were really looking at was 
do we allow interest uh, to be deducted? And, you know, especially like mortgage interest. Well, the, the National Association of Realtors, I think, or the home builders uh, uh, caught wind that we were doing this. And this was before it was public, anything was out, they decided to come have a meeting. And I had the meeting with them and I ended up arguing with them that, no, we're gonna get rid of this. You don't need it. It'll lower interest rates. Uh, you know, they, they just didn't believe, they, they want the mortgage deduction there. Well, uh, following that meeting, word went back up to the top and I got excluded from all other meetings because, <laughs> because I was a purist <laughs> and I and I fought with the home builders, and then they're like, "Okay, Westbury, get you can't be in the room anymore." You know, <laughs> wow. Uh, and, and then we, yeah, and then we ended up putting in the mortgage interest deduction in the bill. Um, so they won, um, but I was willing to fight the lobbyists. But let me make a step back and make a little bit of a broader point. You know, between Joe and Bob and I, we have kind of three. Uh, I'll call us Austrian supply siders, monitors. Uh, free market uh, supply side economists, if you will. And, um, and, and so our positions, I think this, now this is, somebody can call me biased and this is where we could have a debate. I think our positions are backed up by science, if you will. Like if you cut tax rates, you get more of something. If you raise tax rates, you get less of something and incentives matter, uh, stuff like that. So but, but that's the supply side. We believe in entrepreneurial growth and anything that helps savings and investment. If you go to the other side, they believe resources, a, a lot of this boils down to how should resources be distributed, by the market or by the government? And if you believe the government should distribute, uh, redistribute or distribute resources, decide who gets them, that's not really an economic position. That's a, that's a political position. And, and then what's interesting is we've had economists over, you know, century. I mean, John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, he was kind of like Paul Krugman. I mean, he would make arguments, but they weren't, they didn't stand up um, to economic analysis, but he would make arguments uh, uh, to allow the government to distribute assets. So if you're if you go down down that road, you're playing more politics than economics, and then you just use the economics to to paint over to to make it hard to see to have an argument, and then and then and that and that's when, by the way, you lose because by the time you start having those arguments about how much something costs or whether it's going to raise the deficit or lower the deficit, that's when everybody tunes out. So they win, but but so, I, I I would argue that our side, Bob and and Joe and I, we tend to have more real economics behind our policies, where they are just using power and politics to distribute resources. So Brian, just a quick answer to this, and I'm gonna go to Joe for a question too. So if you took these economists outside of the government, would they all then agree with us? My question is, are they doing it like? Do they know they're advocating for dumbass policies when they think the government can allocate resources better than the free market, or do they genuinely believe it like we do when we advocate? Yeah, I, you know, it's really hard for me to say that. I think they believe it. I think they believe that government should be the the decider, if you will, not the market. Uh, they convince themselves that market failure, like the banking subprime crisis was bad, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, uh, but all of those policies just grow the government. And now academics, because usually that's where they go back to, um, typically uh, academics are, they're, they're, they're activists uh, anymore. So, so they keep playing the game. And remember, they all want to get back in the government to the center of power, like Joe said. Um, and, and so they, they, I, I, you know, it's what's, what's really interesting is how I've survived in my career, not playing that game. Um, but I've gone, I go through waves where Fox will have me on because I'm, I'm, I'm with them. And then all of a sudden I'm not with them and they won't have me on. And then the truth. somehow we, we get that. together again yeah. and now I'm back on, you know, yeah. Joe, I'm going to move to you with it. Cause I, I don't like Brian's answer. I want the answer to be that they're lying. <laughs> yeah. They know they're wrong. Well, that this is the be, answer I want. Did you, can you give me true, that answer? 
But here's the thing. I mean, the um, I, I remember when I was the, the last year they had Jackson Hole. They opened it up to the private sector. I remember one of the one of the uh, reserve presidents said to me that, uh, and he got his PhD from a freshwater school, not a saltwater school. But he said, look, he goes, the power at the Fed obviously resides with the board, but importantly, where you go to school is important. So he was saying the places that have the cachet that dictate policy, Harvard, Yale, MIT, University of Illinois. Literally, the, <laughs> all the all the East and West Coast schools. If you're at University of Minnesota, Rochester, Chicago, those didn't count. And that that matters a little bit to your question because when you do graduate work, there's there's a lot of math, and the science wants to be more like physics, not a social science, which is what it is, which to me makes it very fascinating because it's a blend. It was used to be political economy, it wasn't economics. But you've got the history, you've got the politics, you've got some analysis, you've got numbers, you've got charts, graphs, tables. Like it's a really fun, I think, multidisciplinary discipline in that sense. In graduate school, you, these people, I believe, are taught a certain skill. And therefore, you can really do a lot estimating multipliers and their stability and all these other things. So it's almost like their desire to be more quantitative makes them more actively involved because if you say that you know market failure is the exception uh and that the, the market naturally and generally will allocate resources more efficiently then you don't really have that much work to do whereas if you're an activist you get more involved in the modeling and right. in the math and then you can't obfuscate because this is what the math shows and if you look at some that's fantastic you know, that's you know, fantastic nobody reads the darn things um, <laughs> so that's part of it bob you got anything to add to I think it's a signaling device. Like if you have a PhD in some um, highly mathematical mathematical segment of economics, um, and you are more you are basically more likely to congregate and believe the stories told by the other mathematical PhD economists. Um, and that group of economists may have certain biases and certain views. Um, they would love to be in charge pulling the levers on the theories that they've concocted and to see what happens. And they may have some views on the importance of social equity that um, can't be proven. They're, they're essentially kind of like, like almost religious beliefs, if you will, or philosophical beliefs. Like you can't prove Confucianism is right or wrong. Okay. It just is. Okay. It's a philosophy. And if, and if, those people tend to have the mathematical PhDs and they signal each other. They, they can get a level of power and authority in imposing their policies that the others have difficulty managing to, to achieve. I think that's one of the things that drives me crazy about somebody like Paul Cruden, right? And by the way, Joseph, Joe Stiglitz, I can't hear that name without thinking of Inglorious Bastards. That movie just pops into my head every time somebody <laughs> says his name. But... <laughs> I think that's the thing, you know, when I when I talk about the difference between uh, economics, the science of economics and the philosophy of ec economics, I'm really glad I'm a strategist because like I literally put a strategy together and either works or it doesn't. And I know that my average hold time is 26 days, usually in about 25 days. I know if the thing worked or didn't, whereas it seems to me there should be some sort of codex of economic failures of policies that didn't work somewhere. I think most of them are in Paul Krugman's columns. And to me, I, I kind of want to know where I'm wrong on this. Like, do I do I just look too poorly on somebody like him? Or is, is it me? Or do I read things that are obvious? No, Bobby, you know what? I don't, you know, Paul Krugman is a great mind. I mean, and he did mm -hmm. great work at one point. And but I don't, I would say he's up far outside the mainstream. Uh, Joe Stiglitz might be moving more in Paul's direction. So I'm not really sure they matter as much. I really don't. I don't think, I, I think even people on the left would admit that, uh, that, that they're a bit extreme. I mean, even Larry Summers, uh, who I know a little bit, Larry, you know, Larry was, to his credit, he's you know, maybe for a different set of reasons than what, than what you people on this group would, would, would believe. I'm not a big output gap person. I hate the output gap. But Larry said, look, Based on my methodology, this that this uh, this this act that the Biden administration is putting forward in March of 21 is going to cause inflation. So to Lowry's credit, he predicted it. Maybe not on the methodology I would have used or thought was appropriate to this, but he actually made a point that wouldn't have been popular with some people. So I I, I think Krugman is just he's now become more of a zealot. 
than somebody who I think is taken seriously by most people in the market. I don't think anybody in the markets takes them seriously. So Bob, I mean, uh, Brian, um, with my, I think you guys know my opinion on corporate greed. I, you know, I am a greedy bastard. I've started many companies and to make money and a lot of people have been very happy that I've been greedy. When we yeah. hear these people say that, um, when Elizabeth Warren comes out and then it echoes down through all the underlings, um, is, is this some, again, I, I guess it's the same question I asked before. Can you just put a finer point on the corporate greed bullshit? Yeah, it, I mean, this goes kind of back to one thing I was, uh, maybe I didn't say it as well as I could have because I, I it just popped in my head. But if you believe government is 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 the is who should be distributing resources you will do and say anything you can to get control of more of those resources and so corporate greed um is is i mean that's the way you raise taxes on the wealthy and they've done a really good job because you know the top uh, the top uh, income earners pay a vast majority of, of all the taxes that go to the government. And they keep wanting to push that and push that and push that. I mean, uh, you see this in all kinds of different ways. I, I remember when President Obama was arguing that we needed to, uh, we, that private jets were a problem, not just because of climate change, but but I think he, he, he just didn't want um, uh, corporate uh, executives flying around in private jets. He only wanted government officials to fly around in their own jets. You know, he had his own 747, but he wanted to take away your Learjet, you know? And so, so what's fat, I just think this is all part of that argument to bring more power. And, and I, I'm going to add a little bit of a different twist in here because government is, you know, Joe, did, Joe wouldn't go there, but I will. It's seductive. You are kowtowed to, I wasn't in the white house like he was. But I had my own parking spot in the in the basement of Hart Senate office building. The guards knew who I was. I mean, I could, you know, I was like, I wasn't a senator, but I was a pretty senior staffer. And it's seductive. Um, you, you, you know, everybody knows who you are, and they get out of your way, and they let you talk, and all that stuff. And 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 I, you know, I look back at the subprime crisis. And TARP and QE, I believe that model is what we use for COVID. So that was almost like a test run. And if we look at these past from 2008 to today, government has grown massively. And then in order to pay for it, you got to go after these, you know, uh, you have to go after uh, uh, income earners. So corporate greed greedy people, billionaires, you know, we're going to just attack them all. And, um, and it just violates everything that made this country great. We know history and economics. And, and, and yet what we end up fighting about is all these things like corporate greed, when in reality, we should be talking about freedom versus not freedom. But first, yeah. Bobby Iaccino, I'm going to branch this. I think this is a perfect segue into branching it into somewhat of the current condition too, because he mm -hmm. talked about recent policies and how we... Um, use the blueprint for uh, the great financial crisis for COVID as well. So Bob Stein, and, uh, when I was with Scott Shelley today, we were talking about the M2 money supply absolutely exploding and now shrinking 2.9%. Now the only other times in history, and I'm certain all of you know that, but this is for the people watching. The other, there's been four times in history that the money supply has shrank by uh, greater than 2%. They were associated with depressions in 1870, 1920, 1929, and the other time was a crisis in the 1890s. Um, we have shrunk money supply by 2.9% right now. I personally think this time it's different, even though I know that is just the famous last words <laughs> of everyone, but I think it's somewhat different and I don't think it's calamitous. Bob Stein, what do you think? So uh, Brian and I talk about this all the time. And, and I, my view has been for a while that we're gonna hit a recession, 80 to 85% probable sometime between now and the middle of next year. I can't tell you the week, the month, can't even tell you the quarter. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure, although I think it's most likely to start in the second half of this year. I think what's happening right now is that we had this massive 40% increase in the money supply, M2 measure of the money supply, back in 2020 and 2021. So that's a huge wave. It doesn't all, all hit at once. It's gradual. Look at it like a tide. It comes in and then it goes out. 
A year ago, we started reducing the money supply. Okay, so after two years of a surge, you have one year of reduction. The negative impact of that reduction in the money supply, especially if it continues, that negative impact is, is gradually rising. It's going to peak somewhere in the, over the next several months, maybe six to nine months, and then that's going to recede again. So right now, I still think we're in the waning days of the positive influence, positive in terms of GDP growth and inflation, of that surge in 2020-21. And we haven't really fully felt that reduction in M2 that started a year ago. But we will over this next six to nine months. So I think a recession is coming. I think the economy is basically net net is going to be basically flat over the next six quarters. And during that time, there should be about three quarters negative, three quarters positive. So I'm guessing there's a recession that starts a little later this year and into early next year. It's not going to be like the COVID depression. It's not going to be like the the uh, the 10 percent unemployment rate with the Great Recession and financial panic, most likely. But it's a recession like we had in 1990 and 91 or 2001 plus, depending upon how you define it. So there the unemployment rate goes up around two and a half percentage points. So we might peak at 6%. And it's you know, a loss of 2 million jobs or so. So I, I think it's still in front of us. I'm not that optimistic about all the data I've seen recently. We saw that like S&P, PMI. Um, you know, I, I've used that data to try to forecast the US PMI and I can't. It's not, you know, given the other variables I'm using, it really doesn't help. So I'm looking at unemployment claims that are a little bit higher. I'm looking at industrial production, especially manufacturing, a little bit weaker. I'm looking at retail sales, which is up one month over the last four or five. So I, I think we're heading toward a recession still. And it's largely going to be due to that tightening in the money, the money supply that started a year ago. So real quick, let's, let's go Brian, Joe, and then back to you, Bob. In terms of where we are now, um, conference board's leading economic index, uh, indicators, I'm sorry, below zero, two months in a row, never happened in 40 years without having been in a recession. I don't think anyone on this board thinks we're in one right now. Correct me if I'm wrong when, when you talk. The second thing I, I looked at, um, I saw a Bloomberg article where it said basically in the last hundred years, stock market has never bottomed until we were already in the recession. So again, if we're not in it yet, then theoretically it's 100 years, never happened. This time could be different on both of those things, right? Um, but in terms of, I've said this on other shows before. So Brian, do you think I'm dead wrong on this? That I think Jerome Powell got told that inflation was his problem by Biden and Yellen in that meeting in the White House, right? Right. And they basically said, look, we're blaming this on you. So whatever, goodbye, have a nice lunch, right? Yeah. And I think, based on what Michael Farr said about Jerome Powell's personality, that Jerome Powell's like, fine, fuck it. I'm going to keep rates here and I'm going to fight inflation, especially since unemployment's at 3.4%. So if they see full employment at 4.1% and they see the inflation rate needing to be at 2%, are they going to keep rates past where the market is pricing in the Fed the first cut right now? Yeah, you know, there's... there. I, I think the Fed's going to probably keep rates up longer than people think. Um, I because Powell, you know, he doesn't want to be Arthur Burns, and I think he's going to go and hold it until the data get really bad. All right, and we're in a fully blown, full in a full blown recession. Um, just two quick points. Um, number one, the way I describe our world today is that COVID and the lockdowns, all that stuff, we we that's like a car wreck. All right, we had a car accident. And, and, and we broke our leg in four places. And the ambulance showed up and they shot us full of morphine. That's all the money printing, all the money borrowing and paying people not to work. Now, eventually you gotta get surgery. They take you off the morphine and you hurt, all right? And, and so my, you know, everybody thought they felt great when they were on the morphine, but now we're not on the morphine anymore. And that's why I think we're gonna have a recession. But this is, this is unprecedented. We've never done this before. The second reason is exactly what Bob Stein just said, and that is the money supply. And 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 uh, uh, Bob uh, Bob said is that we, the money supply is negative, and that is the fastest decline in money growth we've seen. Um, and you put those two things together: the morphine wearing off, which is the money supply slowing down. But the money supply slowing down, both of those are going to lead, I think, to a recession. Now you can't see it yet, and I and 
you know, money's kind of an interesting thing. Nobody saw the inflation coming. Or I shouldn't say nobody. Very Except few of us. us. Very yeah, few of us saw, saw the inflation coming. Um, but that's what money does. And that's why I think very few people see the recession coming, too. I think it's going to hit kind of out of nowhere and people are going to go, whoa. Um, but, yes, I think we're going to have one. Joe, then Bob, same question. The, uh, I remember 08 because I got, I got uh, negative pretty early and I would, Greg Lippman and I was uh, the Ryan uh, Gosling character in the big short, we go see clients. And it took a while because I got negative in April of 06. And that was, boy, it took a long time. The Fed cut <laughs> in 07, uh, but then you got to 08 and it was like nothing happened. In fact, we were in recession. We didn't know it at the time. Uh, first quarter GDP was positive. It got revised negative. Uh, but then the second quarter re was revised up to over 2%. And if you look at the, like the ISM services actually was recovering and even the LEI started improving, it didn't look, didn't look like there was a recession until Lehman hit and everything kind of fell apart, um, which means we might be in a recession now. It's unlikely, but the point is even when we're in it, we still may not know. If Brian is correct, and he very well might be, that Powell wants to see the whites of the eyes of the deterioration, then the recession will be deeper. It's my view, though, and I agree with what Brian said or Ms. Bob about Biden basically took Powell to task and Powell's responsible for getting inflation lower. He had a come to Jesus moment on that. Uh, my, my thought is that once the unemployment rate starts to go up, and if it starts going up later this year into an election year, the Fed is going to fold like a cheap suit and, <laughs> uh, and, and, we'll be, and we'll be cutting rates. I'm of the view there'll be a recession for a couple of reasons. Number one, the yield curve is both a predictor and a cause of recession because when the curve is inverted, it creates disintermediation. And we're going to see that uh, in further in the senior loan officer survey, which already has shown that when the curve started inverting last year, and that will probably intensify given what's happened with these regional banks. That's one aspect. The other is that if you look at weighted average household borrowing costs, so you take mortgages, auto loans, personal loans, credit cards, those rates are the highest number 20 years. So I'd say that consumer is, and maybe it's this excess money or the morphine that has allowed people to spend longer. I kind of given that short shrift up until recently, but, uh, but borrowing costs are high and credit, money creation, loans, whatever you want to call it, that's weakening. Hard for me to think that you don't have a downturn, but guys, it's going to be fascinating next year because my old boss certainly will, will take the Fed to task. And if the Fed isn't cutting, you know, some of our friends, perhaps on the left, are, who have been yelling that the Fed should be raising rates even more, are going to be the ones arguing the loudest why the Fed should be cutting next year. It's going to be a very interesting juxtaposition. Bob? Well, for me, I, you know, my view is uh, I, I cut, if, if we're right that the recession should hit in the second half, I think that even though the Fed is reluctant to cut, that it will start cutting in the second half of this year, very late, maybe in December, just once, 25, and then cut throughout 24, but I, cut throughout 2024, but do so very close, uh, very gradually, maybe a quarter point per meeting. And that would take us to somewhere in the vicinity, if I'm right that there are two more rate hikes coming, May and June, I, I actually think there are two more, that would take us to somewhere in the vicinity of 3% at the end of next year. So that's still a little above where their long-term trend is. And the Fed can still kind of rest, not rest on its laurels, it, it could still justify its policy by saying it's tighter than it would normally be. And so as long as it sees downward progress toward inflation, even if we don't fully hit 2%, we're not certainly not going to do it at the end of this year, probably not the middle of next year, it could justify some rate cuts in, in that environment or scenario. So uh, here's what I'm going to tell you, Brian, start with you, my opinion on something. And I want to tell you if I'm, I want you to tell me if I'm wrong or right. Um, I believe that the policies over the last three years have created this enormous bifurcation and barbelling in many, many different ways. Not, I mean, in education, in, you know, emotional health, but certainly in families, microeconomics, I believe that money was yeah. transferred from the poor to the rich. I believe that right now we have this barbell. I think the bottom 50% of the people in this country, probably even more, are already in a recession. I mean, their milk and their eggs have gone up, you know, doubled in price, where right. the people who had money that was transferred to them have a crap ton of money. I think that we're in, depending, and, and I don't think any of the, the data can calibrate and register that. Am I right? 
Yep, I, I think you're absolutely right. By the way, just this past week, two two new government policies were or, or, or policies were proposed. One was by the utilities, publicly owned utilities in California, where they want to charge high income households more for electricity than low income households. That tells you right there that people they know people are hurting at the bot in that that bottom of the barbell that you talked about. Uh, the other one is the change in mortgage. They want to change uh, mortgage uh, 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 refinancing and financing cost, and they want to uh, lower them for uh, for people with low credit scores, raise them more for people with high credit scores. These are all- He didn't mess that, mess that up, guys. He said that correctly. Go on, Ryan. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. yes exactly. It's, it's right. But it's all about redistribution and it's trying- you know, that's why they want to they want to hand out money to help people pay their electric bill. And, and you know, we, and we we're doing the UBI with all this extra covid money. Chicago's paying people 500 bucks a month. And it's just it in the end, it's buying votes. But but the bottom line is it's because they realize that that they have to ha they that, that, that these people are hurting and they want to keep them on their team. Um, they don't want anybody to come in and tell them it's because of the policies uh, that these other people followed. I mean, I'm gonna, I, I, it, I want I want to hear um, uh, Bob and and uh, and and Joe comment on this too. I I just had a thought, and it kind of takes us back to where we were um, before our first part of our conversation, real quick. You know, a lot of economics oh, is all about this idea of, of market failure or government failure. So, so this is why we still fight about the Great Depression. You know, so Milton Friedman, this is, you know, the, his massive contribution to come in and say, no, the government caused the Great Depression. Um, uh, Jude Winiski did great work in here. But the left still believes that it was a market that caused it. We had a bubble. They, that's the same thing that happened in 08 with the subprime crisis. It, it, that, that the left calls it a market failure um, and the right says it's a government failure. Fed held rates too low for too long. We put in mark to market accounting, all of those things. But these battles are, are, are constantly being fought. And that goes exactly to what, what you're saying. Whenever the government comes in, people figure out a way to get around it. And then you have a crisis like COVID. They think they're doing all these things that are going to help the lower level and they actually end up hurting them. And that's exactly what we've done again uh, because of COVID. Joe? I brought, I, mean, I can't really add anything to Brian, what Brian said. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty clear. Um, I, I wish I, I'm usually not at a loss for words, but no. <laughs> yeah, none of us normally are. It's what we do. We talk. We don't need to know what we're talking about. Yeah, no, yes, Bob, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, they have to keep the myth going of market failure. Um, and the, what's more important, because sometimes markets do fail. I mean, markets are based on humans and humans make mistakes. So markets are gonna, are, are go people are gonna make mistakes in the marketplace. They're gonna misprice things. Now, they, they, there's an automatic fixing me mechanism in the market that doesn't exist in the government. But what they really have to keep going even more than that is the myth of a lack of government failure, um, because that will, that's what gives them the advantage and the the right, if you will. I'm not I'm not using right the way I want it, but the, but the right or the entitlement, if you will, to be able to make decisions that the market would otherwise make, and to try to fix it to be the to be the herder of the sheep, to, to move things in the direction that they think looks better or is better. The, you know, but you, know, you just made me think of something, Bob, and that is that you know, the thing with the market is that you, people don't like the outcomes of the market. And I get that, okay? It may not always be in people's uh, desire, depending on what group you're in, the market may not work the way you want it. But even in failures, there is some accountability. It may take a while for a CEO to get fired or a board to be replaced. There is some accountability. There is virtually no accountability in government. In the case right. of the Federal Reserve, its powers have expanded since the crisis, when arguably they were a big causes as to why you had the financial crisis, not just from a monetary policy perspective going into 08, but from a regulatory perspective. Right. And even 
in this most recent period, uh, you had, I think the Fed has just done a terrible job. They're going to unfortunately overregulate these small and regional banks, these small and middle market banks. Uh, and when the Fed, you know, this is the problem with forward guidance is that, you know, these, yep. but I'm going to give the, I'm going to give some of these people a, a, a pass for missing the big moving rates because I did. Uh, but I, I just, the Fed's going to get more supervisory power when they're, they're the ones responsible for this deposit flight, <laughs> uh, but they're going to hurt the banks for it. And that's going to make the economy less dynamic, not more dynamic, less dynamic. The big banks have gotten bigger. All the things, so talk about the law of unintended consequences. If you look at the share of the large banks deposit share a year ago and where it is now, it's just gotten even larger. And that's just not going to be a very dynamic economy, unfortunately. I don't know how you make it better. Yeah, this, yeah. to me, the bigger the government gets, the bigger these companies get. You know, COVID, who got yeah. to stay open? Home Depot, Walmart, Target, who had to close? All the mom and pop stores. It, it, I mean, there's your barbell, Jim, like boom. Uh, and, and I think that's also one of the reasons the stock market uh, did well is because if you let the public companies stay open, and the, take the business away from the non-public ones, then you're shifting more, even more profits into the S&P 500, let's say, um, and away from the, the smaller, smaller businesses. I've got an easier question, but Bob, you looked like you wanted to say something. So why don't you go Yeah, ahead. I, keying off what Joe said, um, if there's ever a case for government failure, it's this SBB situation in the sense that They've been arguing, and their side has been arguing since the financial crisis in 2008, that we need more regulation. And they got the regulations they wanted. They got Dodd-Frank. They got more supervisory authority out of the Fed and FDIC and all the other controller currency, everybody else. Okay? And then SVB can still mismanage its portfolio. So what's the purpose of having this additional layer of regulation if you're not actually going to implement the regulations you've enacted to try to secure those, those deposits. It, so if, what are they going to come up with next? Well, we need to regulate more. Well, the regulation has to be imposed by somebody. Somebody has to supervise and make sure the regulations actually followed. So what's the argument for the regulation? You need to go to something else. And the market does have that quality. And not only that, but think about it. After the financial crisis, uh, banks were encouraged to hold high quality liquid assets. Yeah. Treasuries and agency. And Treasuries. Agency. That's what they <laughs> lost the money on. Yeah. Duration yeah. risk. I mean, it's like you can't make this up. It's like it's you know, asinine. It's, like it's also asinine. To it, it before you guys say it like this. Yeah. Before you answer, before Bobby asks the question, I will point out to everybody that SVB could have called me or Bobby. It's literally what we do. We would have taken five minutes to hedge that yep. portfolio. Literally five minutes. Would it cost you money? A lot less than bankruptcy does. Bobby, you had a question? I did. And it's actually an easier question for you guys. So, so my favorite uh, economic book, by the way, as a strategist, I have to admit that every single strategist in the world wishes they were an economist. But after this conversation, I'm not so sure I wish that anymore. <laughs> From a perspective of my favorite economics book is Economics, Facts and Fallacies by Thomas Sowell. Hmm. So I want to hear what yours are. And you get extra credit if it's a book you wrote. But what's a book that a strategist can understand that's your favorite book to read on economics? It's got to be something I could understand. And it, so it could be Dr. Seuss, if that's the best one. Who's going first? Me? Yeah, go ahead, Joe. I'll tell you, the, yeah. best, the best finance book ever written is uh, Reminiscences of the Stock Market Operator. Yeah, there yeah. we go. I had to say that because like, you are probably going to say it right or Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Take it right away. <laughs> yeah. What do you got, Brian? You know... I still think people ought to read Jude Winiski's book, The Way the World Works. Um, I, I also think maybe one of the, the in fact, the, the intellectual underpinnings of Reaganomics was, it, it, you can find it in Wealth and Poverty by George Gilder. Just an absolute fantastic book. But if you really want to get serious, read Human Action. Um, read Road to Serfdom. That's Hayek and Mises, or Me and Mises and Hayek, the way I said them. Um, but those are the original Austrians, and those books are dense and deep. But I, I think Mises is maybe one of the greatest uh, economists to have ever lived. You know, well, I'm being as I'm dense, dense and I'm not very deep, I probably won't be reading those two. Go ahead, Bob. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I'm going to leave the dense and deep stuff to Brian. I like, I like superficial um, and glib. <laughs> So for that, I, I would highly recommend Capitalism and Freedom 
by uh, Milton Friedman. So I, I read that. that actually. That's the great. Mid 1960s, maybe yeah, even great. the early 1960s. And what I really love about that book is how easy to read the book is. The, the, there's no jargon in the book whatsoever. It's very simple. You don't have to be an economist at all. It's really about, a, a, you know, maybe a dozen different, um, 10 or 12 different um, economic issues that were, were uh, important at the time. And they're still important today. Issues like the minimum wage, issues like uh, how much regulation of the workplace with, with discrimination and things like that. Um, it, uh, it's a variety of different issues. How, mu how, much, how high taxation should be? What's, where does federal spending come from? Capitalism and freedom. And it really gives you the connection between capitalism and the political freedoms that we all should like. You just okay, wait, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm going to say one thing. I, it's not. It, it's sure. a good book. It, the first half is really good. The second half wasn't so great, but it's called Lords of Easy Money uh, by Chris. Uh -huh. He wrote the book, and it talks basically about Tom Hoding when he ran the Kansas City Fed, how he kept dissenting. And it's really, really good. So I'm thinking about it because it touches upon some of these other issues we were talking about. It is extraordinary groupthink at the Fed and how Tom Honig would talk to his business contacts and Bernanke would be like, well, effectively, if you can't model it, like you're an idiot, like I don't get away. And how the board controls everything. They're a bunch of technocrats. I thought that was really fascinating because economics and some of the books that Brian and Bob mentioned are kind of like it's theory, but it's theory of like real world. It's dense because it makes you think, but I think so much of today's economics isn't practical. Uh, it's become way too mathematical and it's, it, it need, economics needs more psychology in some sense. And, and, and we don't have that. We don't, have, we don't seem to have a lot of common sense, but that book is very interesting because it really encapsulates what I'd argue is extraordinary groupthink at the Fed. I mean, nobody dissents anymore. How is it you get 19 economists? And economists generally don't agree on many things. I'm sure we talk long enough. There are things the five of us are going to disagree on. But you have 19 people there always effectively in agreement. It's absurd. That's bullshit. Even the it's Bank of England. Absurd. Even the Bank of England has more debate. <laughs> yes, that is kind of comical. I will uh, say what Brian mentioned, Road to Serfdom, F.A. Hayek. So don't anyone be afraid that they said it was dense because I actually think, I mean, it was life changing. I think it's unbelievable book. Um, we got about, let's call it six minutes left. Let's um, go around the horn. We talked a lot about where we currently are. The question now is what gets us out of this where we are right now? Since Brian had to, to, to go get a drink, I'm going to start with Joe Lavorna. What has to happen? Where are we going? <laughs> Well, I tell you what, I don't, you know, I don't want to offend listeners, um, but I think, you know, a certain, a certain person had a certain set of policies that were taking us in the right direction. Uh, it has to happen politically. And um, I, I do think that we uh, need to have a, a thoughtful policy with, with many of our trading partners. I don't like what's happening ge geopolitically. So I'm going to tell you the answer, Jim, is a, is a change in administrations. And I think so. Tell me this, then: if you if if you took out the one person who we know you support, and I'm I'm not saying I don't support him too. Do you see any other candidate no. on the horizon as viable? Okay. I don't know. I don't see any. You don't. No, because the because President Trump's the first president since Reagan to have won the Rust Belt, and his base is extraordinarily um, extraordinarily loyal. I don't. Look, we could debate might may happen in the general election. A lot of it's going to be get out to vote and the voting patterns have changed because we've changed how we vote. People don't generally show up as much in person as they used to. But uh, but the former president, I, I, I see those populist policies that that are basically designed with market mechanisms to help the middle class, lower middle class, which prospered mightily under those three years of President Trump as sort of being the, the ticket to heal some of this division and lack of cohesiveness. Uh, so that would be my answer. And if I'm wrong, it, it still has to come politically. I mean, it has, that's where it has to come from. And maybe it's grassroots, but grassroots, but we do need better policies out of DC. And um, I'm an optimist, hope we get there, but we'll see. And I do want to say this, if there's any listener that's offended by one of our guests giving his or her actual opinion, we don't want you as a freaking listener. So stop. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> we don't care. We'll do this. We do this yeah. if nobody was listening. Honestly. Einstein, what about you? What's the path? OK, so I'm kind of um, I have good news and bad news. OK, 
Uh, uh -oh. The good news is that if we have a recession, like we think, we're going to recover. Yeah, you can't, I think the cyclical, uh, cyclical part of the economy will do very well coming out of the recession because we've we've probably bought too few cars <laughs> over the over the past few years uh, relative to our ability to do so with supply chain issues, and we've built too few homes over the past fifteen years. So I think the cyclical parts of the economy will do fine. But I don't think, um, despite what happens during the recession, whatever happens during the recession with inflation, let's put that off to the side. When we come out of it, we're not going to be stable at 2% inflation. And I don't care who, who's president. We're probably not. I, I think the policymakers at the Fed have a hidden or implicit target that's higher than 2%. Or we're going to be in the 25 to 3% range. I don't think much is going to change that anytime soon. Um, and I don't think whoever gets elected president will want to put a real hard money person there, whether it's Republican or Democrat. So I, I think we're in for on trend, a little bit higher inflation over the next decade than we've experienced over the last decade. And I think growth will be relatively slow as well. I do think a change in presidencies, as long as there's an alignment in the House and Senate, we can get tax policy uh, the way we want. But regulatory policy is extremely important these days, um, much more important than it used to be, um, that we could boost the rate of growth. So now maybe the underlying trend is one and a half. Maybe we can get that up to two and a half. Um, but I think very long term, it's going to be hard to get back to where we were in the 80s and 90s. I don't see persistent 4% growth, 3.5% growth, persistent over a course of a full business cycle, anytime in the next generation or so. And now the good news is that when Rome peaked and then went into the decline, okay, they still had 400 good years. So, so you can have long-term American civilization is in a great, very long-term decline. It's not necessarily an investable decision for this de generation. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to disagree with, with anything that Bob just said. Um, I, 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 although I'm, I do worry, you know, the size of – the reason the 80s and 90s were so great um, is because uh, – is because Clinton and Reagan actually were able to reduce the size of government relative to, to GDP. Uh, we, we, ended, we had a smaller government in 2000 as a share of GDP than we did in 1980. And it wasn't just cuts in defense. Since then, it uh, doesn't matter what party uh, people are from, the government has, has grown and grown and grown. And as a result, that 3.5% growth rate we had in the 80s and 90s we slowed to two, and I think now we're down to about one and a half. And um, and that comes with all kinds of problems. You know, we have housing affordability issues, uh, as as uh, um, uh, we were talking about before. The lower incomes aren't doing as well um, as as the higher incomes, and and that calls for even more government. Uh, government constantly wants to come in and and uh, and and try to do something about the the poor and the wealth gap and all of those things. So I'm not even sure that we can get good policies. And I, you know, one of, one of my least favorite politicians of the last 30 years is, is George Bush, um, W, uh, because Both? He, he did TARP. <laughs> he, he did TARP and TARP was a massive mistake in my opinion. And, um, and we should have never done it and it became the, the, the template for what we did with COVID. We remember when 700 billion was a lot? Well, now 2 trillion is a Nothing. lot. And, right. and so I, I just, I really go, they, they sold the world that it was market failure and it wasn't, it was, it was government failure. By the, by the way, I just want to make one quick point. I, no, people don't call out the Fed enough. You know, if, if, I See, mean, Bobby, Powell, I told you that. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, we argue about this. Yes. Yeah, Jerome Jerome Powell has said over and over again, <laughs> uh, and, and I just heard uh, Christine Lagarde uh, say this the other day, well, the inflation is all because of COVID. Well, well, then why are we raising interest rates? Because if it if it if the Fed didn't if low rates didn't cause it, if the money supply didn't cause it, it was all because of COVID. Well, COVID's over. There's no ships waiting in LA anymore. The supply oh, but it's chains not, are Brian. all fixed. There's a new variant coming, I think. I, I yes. Was told. I'm not sure. <laughs> but these are the reasons. It is Friday, and this segues into the perfect last final question. These are the reasons that we drink. 
In about an hour, I'll be at my bar. I will pour myself a Tito's, this much soda, and a squeeze of lemon. Brian, what will you be having tonight? <laughs> I, I think a little ca uh, cap uh, Casamigos Reposado. Um, Ooh, just a, fantastic. Just a splash of soda in there. Bobby Iacchino, what do you got? I'm going to have water because I had about 16 old fashions last night. You dinner. sound bad today. Something yeah. goes wrong with you. I can tell that you're yeah. off your game. So I am like, like this, is, this is like my third canister of water. <laughs> so just trying to recover. So I'm going to probably have about six more waters. And then I might have a little Jack Daniels bottled in bond to put myself to sleep. Yeah. Joe Lavoria? You know, I'm going to go eat. I'm going to go easy tonight. I've got a, uh, my younger son has a flag football game. So that's, ah. that's what I'm going to be rushing to. I've got the golf shirt. On. I was going to try to work on the range a little bit before I go, but tonight just might be an early night. By the time Friday comes around, guys, I'm tired. I just want to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, man. Joe, Bob. Joe, first of all, when you're at your kid's soccer game or football game or whatever, that's why they invented Yetis. Okay. Yeah. It'll keep it cold. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have a couple Modellos and by a couple, probably six or seven or eight, because we're going over a friend's house <laughs> and where we have contentious debates about college basketballs and NIL and transfers and everything like that. So yeah. I need to have a little bit in me just to, <laughs> to make sure I speak over him dramatically. Bob, well, I like Good. to think I'm a KG veteran, but nothing gets by you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much. This is, this is good fun. And thank you guys for watching. Uh, we, you know, we always argue that we have one of the top podcasts out there and the numbers are proving that it's not because of Bobby and I, it's because we get guys like these three to come on. And I, I, I don't know why you're so kind as to come on, but we appreciate it very much. Thank you so much, you guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. God bless. Thank Pleasure. You.